can make sure that we have started the recording. There it is. The webinar is being recorded. So uh, a, a big welcome to everyone uh, to today's webinar. We are ex super excited to have Ina Dare. I've had the opportunity to hear him speak uh, on several occasions, and uh, Dynamic doesn't even quite um, explain it, right? You are in for a, an absolute treat. So wow. I am going to try and keep these housekeeping uh, to a short minimum so I can hand it over to him. <laughs> Ian, were you going to say something there? Stop it. Stop it. All right. Stop it. Just keep reading everything I told you to say about me. All right. Very good. Um, so a couple of housekeeping things. Let me show you if I can advance the slide. We are recording this uh, webinar and we will send out a link. So take the notes, but know that this will be coming um, as a, uh, you'll be able to uh, watch it again. I will also send out the slides that Ian covers. Um, as far as questions go and chat, there are two different options there, which you should see in the Zoom webinar um, settings. One is for chat, and feel free to chat amongst the other participants. Um, there may be uh, a couple of times where Ian asks you to put something in the chat. Um, use, use that chat for those purposes. But for questions, if you have a specific question for Ian, or if you have more of a, a technical question, um, use that Q&A box and we'll use that. So that'll help us sort of uh, manage um, the questions as they come in. And Ian will be taking questions, um, a couple points in the presentation, and then we will um, try and make some time at the um, at the end of the presentation for questions, all right? Um, we are, all of our, all of us at Bloomering are super uh, excited to have you in today. If you have questions on Bloomering or would like an overview of the Bloomering platform, uh, you can visit uh, bloomering.co slash demo. And that is all I'm going to say about Bloomering for today, but I'm happy to talk more about that. Uh, this is really Ian's show today. So we're going to hand it over. Um, I would try and do an introduction, but this man really has uh, just a phenomenal experience. Um, and we're super, super thrilled. He is currently the executive director of the Grace Point Foundation, and I am now going to stop um, the screen share. I'm going to hand it over to Ian and let him introduce himself and take it from here. Welcome, Ian. Oh, thank you so much, my friend. Good to see you virtually. I know I got to see you at AFP Icon for a bit. Uh, it's been a while. It's so great to be here. I, I appreciate the opportunity uh, Bloom Rain invited me on uh, to be part of today. I love this topic. I know a lot of you have probably heard me speak or have seen me speak at some point. I speak very heavily about mental health in the workplace, especially in the nonprofit sector. Um, but I'm act actively right now running my third organization and uh, you learn so many things along the way. And this is one of my favorite topics to talk about because I know we all struggle with the stakeholders in our organizations, especially when it comes to our board members and our senior staff and how we can get them more involved in the fundraising process because it really takes a team effort to do this so i will share my screen right now josh let's see if we can get this to work well are you seeing that my friend just want to make sure double check we are good. i see it oh um, no uh yes we're good yep we're good to go all right excellent cool. i want to make sure we we did that um it is like I said, really incredible to be here. And I think along the way, I've learned a lot of things, but just to give you a little bit about what I'm doing currently right now, I am the executive director of the Grace Point Foundation. Uh, the Grace Point Foundation is the philanthropic arm of Grace Point, which is uh, the largest behavioral health service organization in the state of Florida. I probably spent the last 10 years of my career focused on some aspect of diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, which led me to the mental health space uh, and to my passion to help end the stigma associated with mental health, recovery, and addiction. So hopefully, obviously, virtual platforms are always difficult for engagement, uh, but I also try to be as entertaining as I can. I promise at some point throughout the day, I will attempt to make you laugh. So please be considerate of those efforts since this is being taped. Um, I promise if you were in person, most of those would probably land quite nicely. I know how my people are in the sector. I know we got three screens opening right now, open right now. We got email on one, working on a proposal or a grant on another, and I'm probably on mute somewhere off into the corner. So if you uh, hear something that you like or see something that pops up on the screen, hopefully we can get you to engage and, and have your attention along the way. So thank you for investing your time today with be with us. We have a lot to cover. I'm hoping that this session will be both tactical and motivational 
for you as well, because as a practitioner, as somebody that does this work each and every day, I, I understand how valuable your time is. And if you invest your time, you really want there to be some deliverables that you can incorporate into your organizations immediately. And I'm hoping that will be the case. I know Steph will send out uh, the slides afterwards, but I also created what's called an action plan that goes along with the slides. I know sometimes a PDF of slides won't jog your memory on everything that we covered today, uh, but the action plan will be about two to three pages uh, of just some uh, actionable steps. I think uh, some highlights of today that can help get you started and, and really figuring out how you can utilize uh, and incorporate leadership storytelling in your organization. So with that, let's get off to the races, Josh, and, and get started. You know, what is your story? We talk about this all the time. Storytelling is becoming probably, and maybe unfortunately for me, because I'm doing a session today on it, one of the most overused terms in the nonprofit sector. But I think nonprofit boards and staff are really often the least utilized group in terms of storytelling. Organizations, we tend to default to telling stories about populations and the families we serve. I know I've done that in the past uh, with organizations like Boys and Girls Club I've been a part of because we focus so much on youth and youth development. Uh, but now that I've moved in uh, to equity and education and social justice and now into the mental health space, I've really come to learn that to really build traction around uh, your brand and mission awareness, that it's, it's it's a great thing to start incorporating others into that storytelling mix. Um, and we've all heard it. We hear from our boards and our staff all the time just how much they like. They dislike fundraising. I said like. I should. I, that's what I hope they do. But we hear they dislike it. And they don't like directly asking for support. So this session is all about how are we going to create those opportunities and those moments for people to be drawn to our stakeholders, our board members, and our senior staff uh, to start those conversations. Because I, I know sometimes we put a lot on our board uh, to help procure sponsorship or auction items uh, or sell tables or sell raffle tickets um, and it's hard to do and we know staff sometimes uh, look a lot to us to raise the funds needed to keep the programs going and the organization viable and they don't really sometimes participate as strongly as we'd like in the fundraising process hopefully today you'll walk away with some great ways to incorporate and change that in your organization so some of the goals that we have today and they might be a little lofty but i'm going to shoot for them uh you know talk about the power of storytelling we've seen infographics throughout the nonprofit sector for several years on how to incorporate storytelling who to get stories from but let's really talk about the power of storytelling on the human behavioral side of things how leaders are influential storytellers and how to prepare our board members and staff to become effective storytellers because a lot of times this requires them to step out of that incredibly uncomfortable place or comfortable place for them which is their comfort zone to get a little bit uncomfortable in a process of being more involved in the mission awareness and the fundraising. Anything new requires a fair amount of preparation, coaching to both our board and staff. So just be prepared to do that. Uh, fundraising will always require a certain amount of learning agility. Uh, this is a term that we hear more and more of lately. And that really is just the ability and willingness to learn from experience and then apply that learning successfully to perform in new situations uh, and new campaigns and new initiatives like this. Uh, so socializing expectations with leaders and just how to capitalize on a campaign once we start getting feedback and engagement uh, and we become more encouraged about how this process can support us. I really do look at the variable of success is how do we get donor attention? So uh, in a 24 seven, 365 communication overloaded world, winning donor attention is a must in order to achieve fundraising success. We're all busy. I don't think when we when people ask us that question, how are how are things going? We just default to the answer, oh, they're busy, you know, and we don't think about it because we're constantly working. I think when we went remote and now many of us are hybrid or some of us are back in the office, uh, the lines between what's going on uh, at home and work have been blurred a little bit. We found through research that we're all working a little bit longer. I know many of us are still falling into the trap of checking email right before we go to bed. That doesn't help our sleep at all. Um, so we really have to see 
what can we do to win donor attention, knowing that we're just as busy, our donors are busy, and understanding that behavior is where we're going to get to the success we need to have. So as communication methods have obviously evolved, uh, become more social and more digital, so really must the practice of fundraising. That's really how I look at it. Um, before you can tell, anybody how great you are or the importance of your organization's mission and really well before you can ask them for money you need to get their attention and uh, today's all about finding that group of people that i think can do that for you the biggest mistake i see nonprofits make today when it concerns communication uh, to their donors really is communicating too often through what I call push messages, meaning they only have value and interest of the nonprofit in mind. Like we serve more than anybody else in the, in the community or we've won this award. And what we're really trying to do is let people know what the need is and how they can help address that need. And as fundraisers, uh, we need to adjust our methods in order uh, to win back donor attention because we know the donor uh, retention crisis in this country. We know we're lucky if we get uh, 19 to 20% of, of first time donors back every year. And we know, depending on the research, what you look at, we're losing 40 to 50% of all of our donors. And so anytime we can incorporate something new into our tool, tool chest to really kind of reach and win donor attention and win donor time, it's going to be impactful to our organizations. So where is donor attention? It's exactly where your attention is. A lot of it is in this device because we're in this device all the time. And I love the fact that an iPhone actually tells you now whether your usage is up or down each week because you can help track this and understand that I know many of your donors are going through the same thing. It's become increasingly harder to reach, again, get the attention of donors and stakeholders. And because of the last 10 years, we've seen a huge shift, not just in how communication uh, is, is put out there, but how we take in that communication. Um, our jobs as fundraisers have often become now really finding out where our donors like to spend their time and then go story tell on those platforms. We can't just assume because we're comfortable with one or two platforms that that's where our donors have comfort as well. Um, LinkedIn is a great example of this. I know I have donors, uh, I have stakeholders, donors, community partners that tell me the only social media they do is LinkedIn, but then they didn't realize that when LinkedIn was purchased a few years ago, it's become very much a content push platform and they're still looking at it more as a professional platform uh, where resumes go to hang out with each other. So, one, so when we talk about where our donors are, we have to really ask them. We have to be proactive about that. And so, you know, when we see traditional uh, donor cards at events, live events, maybe add a line. Where do you like to get your information? You know, it's not just about certain things concerning payment processing information. Let's ask them a few things about themselves as well and their behavior and their habits. Uh, we're all ready there in our personal lives in terms of how busy we are. Um, so really it's coming down to how can we get our personal behaviors to really align with our at work actions? Because if we know we're here in this device and we know we're busy, we also need to know that that's where our donors are as well. So how do you win attention? You want attention by providing value, uh, and that's and and that is a that is a marathon strategy. Uh, that's something I like to say when uh, I came into the mental health space. It couldn't just be about statistics and data uh, and telling people that one in five people will experience mental health diagnosis in a given year. I had to provide value. I had to educate people. I had to tell people how to support people they knew with the mental health condition. I had to address each aspect of mental health and recovery and educate them on that. So again, the strategy became providing value, providing value. And then uh, when I felt I provided enough value and I felt I built up enough social equity, then I could make an ask and feel good about it because the community understood what I was doing the entire time. And we have to do that when and where donors want to receive it. So that's really where the power of storytelling comes in. And one of my favorite quotes uh, really on storytelling has uh, comes from Michael Margolis. Uh, he's uh, the author of Story 10X. He's also the CEO of a company called Story. And a storytelling is about 
connecting people to other people and helping other people see what you see. Uh, it seems simple, but it's so it's so beautiful in the way it's 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 said, because once you see it through that lens, you understand just how powerful it can be. Storytelling uh, it really is one of the best ways to connect uh, with donors and keep them excited about your mission and programs because you get to share with them what it is that you see. So let's, let's talk about the importance of storytelling, what it, what it should really bring to the table. Uh, storytelling should, at really at any level, elevate the importance of your organization. Uh, it does that because stories have the ability to impact us on a profound level, uh, especially when we feel a strong connection to the storyteller. And for most of us in our organizations, that strong connection is for formed through our leadership. Uh, because they have the larger networks and we can we can feel connected to them or sometimes if it was a story related to somebody in our population that we're serving we might not be able to feel that personal connection uh, they remind us that the stakeholders uh, that they have an impact and continually to play a vital role within what we're doing and of course they emphasize that donors are the ones providing a solution to that urgent need. I think uh, if you really look at that last one, uh, stories uh, really are the common ground that allow people uh, to communicate and, and overcome our differences so that we can better not only understand ourselves, but understand each other. And I think the groups that are doing it well really make that connection with their donors. And that's what keeps donors coming back to them uh, each year. So why use our leadership? If this is new to you and you have a, if you have a tough board to work with, I know this might seem like an uphill battle and, and, and 100% I agree with you, but trust me, um, I'm gonna start going into very tactical uh, of how we were able to turn around uh, the Grace Point Foundation and share with you that process um, because my board, prior to me coming on and never been asked to be a part of the branding, never been a part, a part of the storytelling in an organization. So this was very much new territory for them. And I just went in with them and, and letting them understand just why it was important to use them. Uh, they're the least utilized group in, in terms of our storytelling, like I was saying before. And so having an opportunity uh, to develop them as storytellers to effectively share uh, the importance of our work can really provide a tremendous value to an organization. And they give us a lot of great things. Uh, they can increase trust and build rapport with our audience in a way that we might not be able to have done it before. Uh, we're always talking about influencers, not just on TikTok, not just on Instagram. We have people uh, in our own communities that are that are influencers that can uh, lead to a lot of great things for us because their network is so large. And if we can get them on board, we know just because of their interaction, they can attract others to our mission. We need to really take a step back and realize that although we still have to talk about and we still have to tell the amazing stories, the impact stories of the populations that we store that we serve, that really is just one type of storytelling. And just like we do with fundraising, we have to diversify the different ways that we do that. So diversified storytelling really is going to be what benefits us moving forward uh, as we try to increase brand awareness, mission awareness, program awareness. And then obviously we're fundraisers, we're trying to increase funding as well. Donors often say they want transparency. They want access to leadership. They want a connection to who they're giving money to. And leadership storytelling has the ability to do all three of these. Um, as somebody who has traveled coast to coast, uh, I knew one of the uphill things involved uh, with me coming to a new community was getting that community to understand who I was. Um, you know, they understand that there was uh, a process to pick a new executive director. They understand they're trying to fill the role with the best position, the best person for the position. But in order to really uh, ingrain myself in the community, I have to be more vulnerable. I have to share things. I have to get out there and speak to more groups. I have to find a way to share my passion for the mission. And so I was doing this on my own as a new leader, as more of an onboarding process uh, in a community. But what I found was we could really do this as well with our board who've maybe been an existing board member for eight to 10 years and just never really shared their uh, to the mission. And so when we constantly look at the reasons why donors uh, stop coming back to us and stop funding us, we have to realize where this strategy 
can come in and help and really address some of those issues. And that truly becomes the connection to the leader and the access to the leader um, and, and why we're involved in our organizations. Leaders possess three superpowers. I talk about this a lot. Um, you have to really look at uh, and, and explain this to your board and your senior staff because sometimes they've never they've never been shown this. The only superpower a board has only been told that they ever had was the power of their checkbook. And you want to really forget that right now and talk about their influence with their network and with your community. And that's persuasion, recommendation, and referral. And we have to think closely at how those words influence almost every decision we make in our own lives even when it comes to trying a new restaurant when it comes to going to a specific doctor we're looking for recommendations we're looking for referrals uh and so to incorporate that in our fundraising to incorporate that in our storytelling only makes sense of how we can benefit us as an organization so think about you know, who the influence uh think about how who influences your giving because we're I've, fundraisers are some of the best donors. I know fundraisers that like to sample giving to 10 to 15 organizations just to see what the stewardship is like. Um, but we're, we're really good donors. And if we know on average, people are supporting four to six organizations a year, what's keeping those to reoccur to those organizations once they choose to come back to each year. So how have we done, how have we done that and how are we gonna do it? And these superpowers also help us win donor attention because Again, when we're in a 365, 24-7 uh, overloaded communication world, we're going to go back to the groups that have uh, influenced us uh, the most and persuaded us to be a part of those organizations. So for the sake of this session today, I want to look at really three types of leadership storytelling. Uh, and then after, after this, Josh, we'll see if there's any questions, uh, but we'll just go through this really quick before we jump into the breakdown. But for, uh, I, I know there's other types of, uh, of stories, but I think for the sake of this, uh, because we'll, we'll we'll keep going back to this as we show examples later on, uh, personal stories, sharing that uh, special connection to the mission, donor stories or philanthropic stories, sharing why you're philanthropically involved uh, in an organization. And obviously thank you stories. You know, we talk about expressing gratitude all the time. Uh, you know, as fundraisers, we're, we're, we're conditioned to be stewards of gifts and we have timelines that we try to hit. We got to steward gifts within 72 hours of giving. And we put ourselves on a timeline to make sure our donors are thanked uh, for their generosity. Um, and then on, on what I deal with a lot on the mental health side is, I think we also need to uh, express gratitude to our teams and also share in the wins ourselves as fundraisers because this work is hard and we need to remember that. So your, your leaders do uh, have powerful stories to tell, and whether they're personal stories, whether they're donor stories, whether they're thank you stories, these are all examples as you go in to talk to your boards and, and talk to your uh, senior staff of what they can start to think about of how they would like to um, address their networks and address uh, their audiences they have each and every day. And these usually are also the kind of stories that can connect your audience uh, to your mission, connect them to you as a leader, but also resonate really well with donors and potential donors. So with that, I wanna take a short break and then jump in with Josh and see if we've had any questions so far. Yeah, we had one question here and it's very specific to the healthcare space. Um, Lynn is, uh, Lynn asked, I'm from a behavioral health organization too. And uh, um, I find our staff and leaders, especially are fearful of telling stories for fear of HIPAA privacy issues, right? So are there any suggestions that you have? And maybe you're gonna cover that. Um, oh yeah. Is this yeah. Lynn you said? Lynn, uh, I dedicate the rest of this training to you because I know that was one of the biggest concerns uh, that my that my agency staff have. We're, we're a crisis mental health facility just to, to provide further context uh, to the group today. We have uh, inpatient and outpatient behavioral health services. So obviously confidentiality, HIPAA laws are things that we have to be aware of. Um, the best part about 
uh, and and more context to that, this is something that I know the healthcare space has to be cognizant of uh, very differently than maybe a youth development organization where uh, with, when we have permission slips and we have permission from families to use pictures or names, it's a little bit different. We can't do that in our space. Sometimes it's hard to tell stories in our space because we'll, we'll share an impact story and then we just have to put you know, at the bottom, instead of somebody's name, it just says client, or it says somebody in whatever program, and it just doesn't have the same impact. I think when you do leadership storytelling, and we're going to fully vet this out, Josh, just so I know I, I touch on Lynn's question, how we were able to do that so that they were able to make an impact in a space that's always traditionally been difficult to share stories. So uh, we'll jump right into that. And uh, Lynn, if, if I don't answer your question today, uh, I will definitely make sure that I never speak again, because this is what the whole training is about. <laughs> I want to make sure uh, that I've, I've spent a lot of time addressing this uh, with my board members. We have set, we're a large organization, 600 plus employees. We have three boards. So I have a FQHC board, primary health care board, a corporate board, and a foundation board. So I've had to really uh, work with a lot of people in our space to overcome some of these challenges. Uh, Breaking down leadership storytelling, you know, the session day will focus on the six aspects of leadership storytelling. Uh, you know, how do we get started? Uh, quickly, a quick disclaimer, uh, no board members were hurt in this process. Uh, just want to make sure you guys are aware of this. I know we all struggle with our boards at times. I know it's easy to, to place blame on board members at times. I also know that the best uh, training and professional development for fundraisers is to serve on a board as well. I think we've become more empathetic uh, to some of the needs of our board members when we do that. Uh, but this is all about really activating your board as influencers in your community uh, and as advocates for your missions. And so we're going to cover just how to prepare them. And, and again, it takes coaching. This is outside your comfort zone. And we all know in, in outside our comfort zone is not the place where we thrive. So we really have to take our time and, and, and share in the and share in the process. And sometimes that takes taking people who are willing to be eager to be early adopters and jump in, start with them and let them share how the process went. Uh, helping leaders find their voice. I got a great example to share here because sometimes uh, they send you back a lot of words and then you need to coach them on really trying to find their voice within those words and we'll, sh we'll show that. Um, you know, working with the creative team. Uh, you know, I, I know we all know uh, and we have board members that know people in the creative space, whether they're photographers or videographers, and we really have to be the directors of, of these campaigns. And then launching the campaigns and then also learning how to amplify them after some prototyping and seeing what works. So preparing your leadership. Uh, this is usually where a lot of the, the comfort level gets exposed. Uh, really presenting the idea, letting them know I came into my organization, the seventh executive director in 10 years. Uh, I was told congratulations. You're the last one we're going to hire. So after a great pep talk, I quickly figured out that what after talking to board members and kind of uh, checking on the feasibility of the organization, what was working and not working, uh, having to do with marketing, branding, events, fundraising, we weren't really getting any traction uh, for an agency that had been around 70 plus years. A lot of people just didn't know we existed in our community. Uh, and that was baffling to me because you've been around 70 years, you've impacted a lot of people, you've saved a lot of lives. Uh, you're talking about something that's very emotional and very personal for a lot of folks. So how can we share that passion, that advocacy with our community? Um, so letting people know right away kind of like what what are, what are some of the things that's expected of them in terms of participation engagement uh and what are the goals for the campaign they need to know right away because anytime you're in again in a space where you're uncomfortable they want to see where the light is at the end of the tunnel uh, and see where we're all trying to go together um and then after you have that group conversation because we know it's our boards we have to follow up individually because there's usually two to three people in that group that don't feel comfortable speaking up in the group and and you want to address their concerns privately and then reassure them what the goals are for the campaign uh and then again like i said before we all have board members that are eager to be the first ones to do stuff 
you know, uh, we talk about early adopters a lot of times in other aspects of technology, and there's always those early adopters on our boards. Um, but since this is new to many in our group, they'd never, most of them had never been in a photo shoot before. They asked me if we were just doing headshots for their LinkedIn profiles. I said I wasn't doing LinkedIn profiles. I know some of them were, were newly single. This wasn't for their Twitter, this one for their Tinder accounts. This was for storytelling and, and these photos were gonna have a purpose to go along with, uh, you know, a personal connection to what they have to our mission. Uh, so examples. You know, we've been we've been told over and over and over again for those of us in the nonprofit space that are very familiar with Simon Sinek that we struggle as organizations, we struggle as fundraisers to really explain the why of our organizations. Now we had been around 70 plus years, as I had said, we we're really good at the what and the how. Like what were we? We were behavioral health. You know, we are crisis behavioral health. Uh, how, do, how, do, how do we serve our community? Through inpatient services, outpatient services, uh, case management programs, homeless services. Uh, why do you do it? And that's where everyone would just look around the room. Uh, we're hardwired to really think about the how and the what, but we really uh, don't ever really spend a lot of time really pursuing our why. Uh, and for that reason, uh, you know, a few organizations know why they do things or and, and, and even even to greater extent, why some of the people that are on our boards, why they're involved. And so I turned it around on my on my organization and I asked people for the first time and some of them been on our board for eight to 10 years. Why are they involved? What is it about the work we do that moves them? What is it that makes them passionate about serving uh, people suffering? from mental illness or in recovery uh, or an addiction issue. And it was some of the best conversations and the best engagement at the time that many of them said we'd ever had as a group. Uh, and to go through that process together and to hear from each other uh, why they were passionate. Um, you know, again, in the mental health space, I had a gentleman on my board with a, bi a bipolar one diagnosis who'd never really had an opportunity to talk about that with their fellow board members. We had two people that had lost uh, children to suicide. Uh, people had known that that had happened, but they didn't really know uh, some of the, the intricacies of that and, and, and why the person was so passionate about speaking to families or working in a faith-based community and, and some of the other things that they were doing because they hadn't had time to really explain it. Uh, turned it on our staff. Uh, some people have been there 20 years. Uh, and it's hard work. I mean, when, when you work, uh, in homeless services, you work with high needs populations, you work in crisis behavioral health, it, it stays with you and you take it home and you need to focus on self-care. You need to find uh, ways um, to really work your way out of the hard work you do each and every day. And a lot of us do incredibly hard work each and every day, um, but we haven't had an opportunity up until this point to really share why we do the work in the first place. You know, our why is our purpose, it's our cause, it's our belief. Uh, letting people know why we care. And that's not only powerful for, for your donors to hear, for your community partners to hear, but it, you know, turn that, turn that around internally. It was also really great to hear uh, for our staff and our teams. Um, because when you work in a large organization, you don't sometimes get to get that out of your supervisor or your manager or your director. And to find out why they're personally connected to the work that we do. Um, is a great way to build relationship and empathy within the organization. Uh, you know, Simon Sinek is his, his bread and butter is people don't buy what you do, they buy, they buy why you do it. And so telling that to board members, you know, just saying you're on the board of an organization is not enough anymore. And we know this, but saying why you're on this board, why you're so connected to it is really the magic in that. And so what is that Look, what does that look like? Here's an example of that. And I'm using an example of our COO of our organization who had been with the organization 20 years and never had an opportunity to conceptualize uh, or, uh, or share why, why uh, she was so proud uh, to work in, in this field. And then I have uh, next to her a board member uh, with the bipolar diagnosis who really just shares why he believes the work that we do is so impactful. So when you go back and you and you look at what are those three stories we're telling, you know, those donor stories, those philanthropic interest stories, and those thank you stories, those are going to be shared throughout 
uh, this process as we dive into some of these and, and how this process works, uh, you know, with, with the opportunity each had to be involved. And some people, again, jumped at the fact. And once they produced something, they were able to go back to other folks that were a little bit hesitant, had a little bit of anxiety about the process and just share uh, just how positive it was for them. Uh, Josh, I'm looking up in the Q&A and I see there might be a couple of questions there. So I wanna address those before we, we dive in more. Perfect. Um, so we have some questions. I think I think you talked a little bit about this, but um, a question from April about human uh, the or, the organization um, that she works with is uh, deals with human trafficking, and those stories are not easy to tell. Sometimes, do you have any suggestions on um, on, on, on telling difficult stories? Yeah, I mean, trauma and future storytelling is is a huge deal. We have a lot of people that are turned off. Uh, Anytime you put somebody's trauma or pain on display, we, we've become, uh, some people become desensitized to it. Uh, people will have become visceral to it. Um, it, it. It's been known to work in some cases and it's been known not to work in a lot of cases. That's why I like to really mix up the storytelling. You know, if there's people that are involved, like why does the staff do it? Working in that space is incredibly difficult. And I, uh, one of the people that uh, I worked with really closely with my book was was really involved in this space and done documentaries on, on human trafficking. And it was tough to tell those stories uh, when she was allowed to tell them with permission to tell them. But it was even more powerful when she was able to tell why she's trying to uh, bring light to the situation and educate people on the importance of this situation. I think in combination, uh, those story, that storytelling in combination with the story of, of the population you're serving is, is extremely powerful because you're giving people stories in ways that they're finding it more acceptable to take in the information. I'm in the mental health space. Not everybody in the mental health space, especially at the board level, has either a mental health diagnosis or is in recovery. There's other people with lived experience that have an opportunity to share that, whether they were a caregiver for somebody or whether it was they was impacted because of somebody they worked really closely with or had a close connection to. And there's a lot more people that have an opportunity uh, to relate to those stories than we think. One of the best ways that I've found to start the storytelling process or start the receiving of the storytelling process is any group that I talk to, no matter the size, I always ask who in the room has been impacted in some way by either mental illness, suicide, or addiction, either yourself, someone in your immediate family, or one of your closest four to five friends. Well, when you, when you ask the question that way, you're allowing more people in the room to raise their hand because so many of us have been touched in some way. You're not just asking who in the room is in recovery, who in the room has known somebody with an addiction issue or mental illness. And so it just really starts a receiving process a little bit differently. I think the more people that are surrounding the organization, the frontline workers, uh, the board members, um, why some of your donors uh, continually want to be a part of this issue, the more you start sharing those stories, I think you'll start reaching people in a different way that where you don't always have to default to the population you served or having to tell the next trauma-informed storytelling scenario. You have to mix it up. You just, you just, you just have to, I think, uh, to reach the, a wider audience. Yeah. There's another question from Megan and Lorraine, uh, very similar. And then Tim asked, um, the organization that Tim works for is uh, a capacity building organization that uh, provides uh, policy advocacy. And again, they don't they don't have direct um, uh, a population that they serve, right? They're sort of the the second step. They're helping the helpers. Um, and I think you know what you are saying is that this applies for that as well, right? Tim can tell his story on sort of why he's involved in the organization, right? Or the board members or, or things along. So would you add, was there anything you would add um, to that, uh, Ian? Well, I, I think when, when you talk about 
storytelling, helping the people who are helping people. There, there's a power to that. I think, look, look at how we've been fundraising. Let's just use one platform on Facebook and we see a friend doing a birthday fundraiser. There's very little storytelling ever put to that anymore. We see it, we become desensitized to it and a lot of us stop giving. When that first started happening, I remember I was giving to every fundraiser for almost you know a year and a half before I realized, wait a second, I'm not learning why people are passionate about this cause. That's that's something that most people are leaving out when they do those types of campaigns. Um, anytime you have somebody, whether they're directly related to it or intellectually related to it, it's important. I'm not in the environmental health space, but some of the storytelling that I've seen on what we have to do to support our environment in the advocacy space has impacted me in a way that I've supported those organizations. I think it still comes down to uh, how are you directly getting the, the reader of the story or the person involved, engaged in the story to feel the need that's out there? And uh, I, I'm saying through this, a great way to do it is through the influencers that are already all in on your organization, that's your staff and your board, but you can do it with other influencers as well to a point to where you don't desensitize your audience to what's happening. Great example there. Um, I remember a lot of us, when we heard the Sarah McLachlan song in the arms of an angel, we were drawn to the pictures from the, from the ASBCA and animals that were suffering in, in, in all these different situations. We've now almost become desensitized to that. And when that pops up now, we start to change the channel or move away from it because we've seen it. Um, we've now seen they've gotten rid of that campaign, although we still talk about it, it's been gone for a while and they're starting to socialize those issues uh, in, in, in the animal space and the humane society space a little bit differently. Um, that's what we're trying to do here uh, with all of our board members and all of our staff. How are we gonna socialize mental health? Already a tough subject already a personal subject matter to address how are we going to how are we going to address this in a way that we can reach all of our audiences without them having to turn away from it because we know if we ask the question as inclusively as we can that 95 percent of the people are going to raise their hand that they've been impacted in some way um so that's kind of the it's, and i think we're going to see a little bit more of that uh in the in the following examples and in, in, in some of the stumbling blocks that we had along the way um, i'm not just going to share the examples that worked we're going to share how some of this didn't work uh just to give you an idea of how we prototype this okay so we have a lot of questions but we only have 18 minutes so i'm wow. gonna let you yeah i know okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, and, and i want to make sure that uh the action guide will go out and i'm sure email will go out as well and i'll make myself available uh to whoever i can because i know i know this is a powerful tool that uh we all want to be involved with a little bit more. Um, so, you know, one of the first questions I usually get uh, and get asked is, is why stories? Because we know stories, if done right, can really convey impact and gratitude and the need of what we're trying to address in our organizations. Uh, because of this, stories are powerful tools. And, and from my perspective, uh, to fight and end the stigma associated with mental health and addiction, uh, it takes powerful tools to do this. So let's talk about the content creation process Obviously, uh, this isn't easy. Uh, I, I, you, you ask board members, hey, can you give me a quote, a uh, certain amount of word length, and then we'll go through it together. And then uh, what you get back, you'll be surprised. It'll be anything from a dissertation to a college entrance essay. And all you wanted was a, uh, you know, 200 words. So you really spend a lot of time really trying to help people find their voice. And so you can give them prompts, open-ended questions, get deep if you have to, what connects you to the mission, uh, what, 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 a lot, what moved you to align yourself uh, with our services and our programs. Um, and sometimes this requires a large amount of information and thought uh, and working with them to narrow it down. Uh, but I, I like to lead them to as much as I can, talk about that moment in time uh, that you made the decision to give. There's always that, powerful moment that if you really talk to your donors and ask your donors, uh, what was it? What was it that you heard? What was it a specific story? Was it a specific way a story was told? Was it from a specific uh, person involved in the organization? You'll be surprised with what you get back. Um, and a story that really answers that question, why I give. Now, these are these to us as fundraisers, as people who to champion missions and, and do everything we can to show the amazing uh, work that we do, that our staff do. Uh, this might seem a little bit easier, but here's an example uh, that I actually did get back. Uh, 
And I just basically asked for the same thing that I was being told before. Like, why do you give? Why are you passionate? And this is what I got back. Why largely silent to those not directly coping with the symptoms and repercussions. The reverberations of severe mental illness are deafening and multitudinous in the lives of sufferers and their loved ones. When this discord amplifies to crisis, Grace Point provides a refuge for mental health harmony through emergency stabilization and long-term patient treatment. Uh, board members say what? I mean, it was, uh, now I, I will, I have teased him a little bit. He is a lawyer. Uh, he thought this was the perfect quote to add to a photo to send out to explain the power of what we do. Um, and we worked hand in hand to really figure out what the voice was, although the words were confusing and you might have to have a legal background to decipher them. We wanted to really get to what he was really trying to say. And that's what it takes sometimes. You ask for one thing, you're going to get something, and it's a process, but you really got to find uh, your cadence with your board members and with your staff on really narrowing down of what is it that makes them passionate. If I have a father here like Bill who lost his son to suicide, he get he would get very emotional and passionate, and he first turned into me about 500 words, and we really narrowed it down to the work he wants to do, what he wants to accomplish, and why he does it, and that's conveyed in that quote. Uh, Tracy is a former nurse for 20 years, and she moved over. She's our director of adult services, and really passionately kind of told that she considers this work a privilege of working with her population, and she's got one of the toughest populations to work with. Uh, adult crisis uh, mental health maker act uh, folks that are uh, in probably in that period of time, uh, one of the strongest emotional states they'll ever be in and to be there and to have an empathetic leader in charge uh, of a staff that's doing amazing work is incredible, but she'd never been ever in a place to share that work. So we repeated the exercise with our board and our senior staff. Uh, we continue to refine this process each and every year. Uh, we change it up as much as possible. The more people that see this in our community, the more new staff that come on, they, they, they jump to be part of this process. The feedback we've received uh, has been incredible, both internally from staff that really wanted to see why their leaders were, or, uh, were involved in what we do. It's great for uh, new staff, and it's great for recruitment of, of, of talent to see why your leaders are involved in an organization. Um, set clear uh, expectations with the creative team. Artists are artists, and I love photographers and videographers, and they do amazing work for us, but sometimes we give up too much control. I tell people, uh, you don't have to dictate the direction of the creative work because that's their realm, but you have to direct it. Uh, share your vision and your reasoning for why you want something done. You know your donors the best. They just know their craft, and so there has to be uh, a merge of that experience and that knowledge so they know exactly what you're trying to get out of it. Uh, always review what your goals are. And I think that really helped as I worked with different people along the way. Sometimes a relationship doesn't work out. Sometimes it does. But when you can really work with somebody to explain what it is you're trying to go, it just makes sense. Let's talk about the creative. Uh, not all backgrounds tell the same story. And this is what we had to really show and share with the people that were involved in these campaigns. Uh, a lot of people ask, why don't we do color photos? Why don't we do more photos that we're, we're smiling more? What are we going to put next to our pictures that's going to really emphasize the emotion uh, and the power of our impact statements? Um, and so going through this process and then sharing it slowly with each of our board members, why black and white photos seem to be the best way to convey our message versus color photos, why, why have the option of sitting down, of standing up, and then listening to their concerns as well through the creative process uh, because you want them to feel comfortable. And I, I, I know we talked about being uncomfortable and there's opportunities to be uncomfortable throughout this, but at the end of the day, you want them to keep coming back to wanna to refine the campaigns uh, and improve the campaigns as we see it and expand them as well. So obviously looking through the examples that we've had before, have an idea about what you want with the creative, how you want it displayed. This isn't a glamor shot photo shoot. Again, these aren't uh, the opportunity to make up for maybe how bad we messed up our driver's license photos. This is an opportunity to really pair an impactful statement of why we give, why we care, uh, why the mission is impactful to us, uh, 
with with an expression or, or with a picture that conveys uh, just how powerful that is. And you got to listen to concerns. You're going to have concerns from different people. You're going to have generational concerns. You're going to have different concerns from men and different concerns from your women. I, I've heard, and you got to work with those and you got to be cognizant of them, cognizant of them because you want them to keep coming back. I know for me, having the, having the choice of what was cropped out, what wasn't cropped out, sitting down, standing up, taking a few frames of each really made each of the participants in this campaign feel like they had some control uh, of how the campaign was being disseminated and they really felt a part of it. If I just went in there and said everyone's sitting down in the same pose, everyone's going to wear the same style or the same color or whatever, uh, it wouldn't have gone off as well. I think they liked having uh, some ownership in the parameters of which you set. And then understand you got to choose the right look for the quote. And this is one of my favorite examples because at the time he was our chief human resource officer. He loved, absolutely loved the color photo on, on the left. Uh, wanted that to be the picture, the picture to go with his uh, quote. And what I found was I told him, I thought he took the best photo of the entire photo shoot, the one that we ended up using, but I had to explain why we wanted to use it. And once he saw the quote paired with the photo, he just felt it had more of an impact than if it would have been paired with the one that he chose. And I think if you lead them to the direction of why you're going during a certain during a certain path with the campaign, the understanding starts to click a little bit of just the power and the impact that these statements have. Launching a campaign started internally first. And uh, the reason we did that is because we were experiencing an all time low with morale in our organization. Again, when, when you're working for an organization that does deep work and does impactful work, uh, people take that with them. And so once they started, once we started to share the campaign, to feel like our staff were getting to know who our board members were a little bit, to feel like the staff, especially the newer staff, to get to understand and learn who their leaders were. And we, the feedback from that was tremendous. Um, that really uh, generated a lot of interest for other staff and other frontline workers to be involved in the campaign like they are today. Shortly after, we said, before we launch as an organization, we want you to launch it on your own site. Now, obviously, there was a little bit of hesitation to that, but there's always those people who are willing to jump in first. I would have them come back and report in the meetings just how, uh, how, how did that go? What was the reaction? What was the engagement level? And almost to a board member and almost to a senior staff, when they posted on their own personal site, it was the most engaged piece of content they'd ever posted because their community, their network had never seen that level of engagement from them in a campaign like this for something they were involved with. And so we ask our board members to do a lot. And when you can create a campaign, and we ask our staff to do a lot as well, uh, when you can create a campaign that brings people to them that's where you're really gonna find a lot of uh, amazing things happen. And I wouldn't ask any of my people to do this process without me getting involved in doing it as well. And like I said, it was an opportunity for me who came from across the country uh, to really share my why and what I'm passionate about uh, and why mental illness is important to me. And once potential donors and donors and community partners saw that, they felt a stronger connection to me and it was easier to make a relationship seem a little bit more seamless than it would have been more of an onboarding process if they haven't had that opportunity to do that. And we continue to do this campaign to this day, and we continue to prototype and test it in our marketing and our branding. These are full page ads that we take out uh, because Tampa has a lot of sports teams. They just happen to be some of the best sports teams in the United States. Uh, for those that are following the Stanley Cup, going for a three-peat, I had to put that, I'm contractually obligated because I live in Tampa to talk about that. Uh, we tested, you know, how, how, what was the engagement level when we put three stories out versus if we put one story out, uh, what did we get back? Who did we hear from? What level of engagement did that drive uh, to someone reaching out to us at the foundation and seeing if they wanted to get involved? We looked at what was it like uh, when it was just uh, on digital format or was in uh, a traditional magazine format. And then when it was time to amplify those stories, we took the ones that resonated with people the most, and that's the ones we went all in on. So it takes a little bit 
of prototyping, a little bit of testing. But when you when you have the opportunity to do that, both on the digital format way and maybe in a, in a print way, you really get some great feedback of what resonates best with people. And as we discovered and as we move forward with that, we saw that as we changed things, we changed our logo, we started incorporating leadership, we started incorporating more personalized stories, we started including different information about the organization. Everything along the way kept leading a little bit more and a little bit more to people understanding the need for our services in the community uh, and why, uh, basically the why of our organization was being expressed more to people uh, in a great way. Um, again, we've utilized relationships uh, to be able to get advertising uh, as a nonprofit partner because of uh, connections to mission. Uh, a normal full page ad in a Lightning yearbook or a Tampa Bay Buccaneers yearbook that goes to all season ticket holders that sold in the arenas or the uh, stadiums might cost somebody $28,000 to $30,000. As a nonprofit partner, we get it for less than $6,000. So anytime we can find an opportunity to use underpriced attention to get in front of a wide audience, and then use uh, those stories that we have tested that we found resonated the most was a great way to do that. Um, as the leader of an organization, as the one people give money to, I'm involved in a lot of these campaigns uh, because people felt comfortable giving me money as a leader once they learned what my why was. And that was exciting uh, uh, to be able to establish relationships after only being here a very short time. And then as we worked with other partners. I see you, Josh. As we work with other partners, uh, it's great to share the stories in terms of when they're writing about mental health. They like to include our campaign uh, because it really brings uh, together just how all of us can get involved in something like this. Uh, it's more than just writing a check. Mental health needs more activists, uh, advocates, and champions, and this is a great way to display that energy and that passion. We're fundraisers. Fundraising is still the goal. I like to say people give to an organization because doing so offers them a chance to write their own story while at the same time join in a shared story. And it takes leaders to do this. And we need to help our leaders with this effort uh, and creating these campaigns through leadership storytelling is an amazing way to, to help them uh, become the fundraisers and the brand advocates we want them to become. So the best thing about all of this, as we go to the last two slides, the best thing about all of this is the return on relationship really led to the return on investment. Uh, people engaged openly with our people on Facebook feeds, on LinkedIn feeds. A lot of people also DM them privately about their connection to the mission, thank them for their vulnerability, asked how they could get involved. And that was the magic of all of this. The relationships, the deeper relationships formed through people that might've just been connected or linked in together, but didn't know uh, on a personal level how they were impacted by what we do. And then that led to further down the road, being more involved with our organization, either at a board level, volunteer level, or at a donor level. Innovation happens in times of reevaluation and adjustment. Uh, we know the last two years, fundraisings look different. It's been more digital. It's been more virtual. Events have looked different. We, we're not around each other and seeing each other every day. Stewardship has looked incredibly different because saying thank you now is more to do with the click of a mouse than it does a handshake. So fundraising, again, will always require that learning agility, just being able uh, to learn from our experiences and apply to the new. And for the last two years, we've definitely been in the new. So as I asked at the beginning of the presentation, What's your story and who do you want to tell it? And I think COVID has taught us that not all best practices work all the time, uh, but through the chaos, we've definitely discovered plenty of emerging and evolving practices. And I think we can continue to evolve this kind of campaign and this type of involvement in our senior staff and our leaders to do the best for our organizations as we possibly can. And with that, Josh, Thank you so much, my friend. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to this amazing group today uh, about something that's been so impactful in my journey with the Grace Point Foundation. Well, we are so thrilled uh, to have you uh, today, Ian. I think I, a lot of the questions that come in, I think you covered in different uh, facets, kind of looking about some leader, leadership transitions and who do you 
who do you pick? And it sounds like there's, um, you know, there's no wrong answer, right? You, there's, you got to get voices from uh, um, across the organization uh, and, 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 you, and leverage them to the, to the best that you can. Um, we are going to uh, fire up a quick poll here um, for, uh, for additional information. So if you'd like uh, additional information, Ian's, uh, he has his book right here. Uh, if you'd like additional information on Ian's book or just Ian um, in general, he is available to speak at conferences and, and with, for, uh, with organizations. Um, so if you'd like additional information, uh, check Ian. If you'd like additional information on Bloomerang and how Bloomerang can help you um, spearhead that message and, and help you uh, get your stories out um, to the right message in the right time, uh, feel free to click that box or there's the I'd like to know about more about both and I will follow the both of you all. So um, that is perfect. Uh, we'll let that poll keep running. Um, and unfortunately, we are at time. But uh, Ian, thank you again um, for taking the time with our uh, with our audience. You are a true thought leader in the space and we are just so um, appreciative of the time that you gave us and um, all of our, our listeners today. So uh, until next time, um, for those of you, we are uh, we do have another webinar next week uh, with Lori Jacobeth. Um, feel free to check that out on the Bloomerang website. Um, but until next time, we will we'll see you guys uh, next next Thursday. And Ian, hopefully we'll see you at the uh, conference soon. See you soon. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Take care, y'all.